Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to our class, The Life of the Teotokos. Um, thank you, you know, to Father George for letting me put this class on. Um, this is for my practicum in the pastoral school. And what we're going to talk about today is this is a book written by St. Maximus the Confessor. Um, just so you know, St. Maximus the Confessor, he lived uh, in the seventh century. He was probably one of the most important theological saints of the church in terms of um, just some of the writings that he's bestowed upon us, many of which are in the Philokalia. Um, he's a saint who was tortured um, for pressing against the heresy of Manichaeanism, which is a whole thing we could get into, but I really want to stay on topic. But in any case, um, the life of the Theotokos. So what we're talking about is, and you'll see a lot of overlap in St. Maximus's writings with what we find in the Holy Gospels, but there's also a lot that's different too. Um, primarily, you know, aspects of what she did in between events. Um, and I'm hoping that that will be really spiritually edifying for you as we approach Annunciation, that it'll really give you a different view of these holy feasts. Um, I think it'll enrich in it. I think it'll enliven it. I know it did for me when I read it um, about seven years ago. It really touched me. Um, and, you know, it helped me get closer to the Theotokos as well, um, just by knowing these things. And I, and I think it will for you too. Um, there's a lot of stuff we're going to unpack in this talk. I'm going to do my best to cover all of it. Um, I do recommend reading the book if you ever want to go you know, get more information about this. Um, it is accessible. Um, there's two real copies out in English right now. There's one uh, on Yale University Press um, by a fellow named Stephen Shoemaker. And that one I think is probably the better of the two. Um, the only problem is it's a little bit expensive. So I usually recommend folks get the cheaper one. Um, the uh, cheaper one is by um, the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre from Jerusalem, um, also excellent much smaller version, um, doesn't have all the biography and all the introduction of like how they translated it and how it came about, but I, th I still think it's equally as, as helpful. Um, one of the things that I think is a question that's going to come up is if this is not in the Holy Gospels, then how is it still valid? Well, we all know, or I hope we all know that in the Orthodox Church, we have kind of two great pillars. We have the script, the Holy Scriptures, and we have the holy tradition and this is something that fits into the holy tradition as orthodox christians who don't believe that the divine revelation of god has ceased since the gospels were written we believe that they it is still the lord is still teaching us things he is still revealing to us um and uh you know and there's also a whole oral history in the church that is is sometimes not written down but is passed on. And we also have to understand that some texts did get lost or destroyed over time. So just because our academic scholars today like to look for some kind of paper trail and they want to see a paper trail of how we connected from A to B to C and they can't find it, that that doesn't mean that it's not true. And these writings have been vetted by the church for the last 15, 1600 years. Um, they are seen as true. And some academic writers will sit there and throw fits about, you know, whether this was really St. Maximus who wrote it or it was pseudo Max. We don't care. We don't care. We believe it's true and we move from there. So that's something we want to keep in mind. We don't care what some academic guy thinks about, about our saints and about the writings of our church. Okay. We're going to keep questions to the end. Um, but uh, with that, let's, uh, let's move forward into the life of the Theodos. So to begin, we're going to talk about um, two saints who relatively don't show up in the gospel, St. Joachim and Anna, all right, the, the parents of the mother of God. Um, Joachim and Anna were relatively older, advanced in age is what St. Maximus says, um, when they wanted to have a child. And one of the things that is important is that they were of a very important line um, from Judah, and that made me, it meant that they were then related to 
the descendants of King David. Okay, so because Christ is going to come as the, you know, the, as the Messiah is going to be the new David, right? And also the bloodline was mixed between priesthood and royalty, which was something that had come from that line of Judah. So we, why is that important, right? Because we only, we not only do we have Christ as the king of, uh, the, uh, of this new Israel, right, of the New Testament, but he is the great king, but he's also the high priest, Right? He's the pre high priest of the church. He is um, the Almighty. And so it's important to note that those two bloodlines have been combined and were in Saints Joachim and Anna. Okay? Now, these two individuals were exceedingly pious, um, God-fearing, God-loving individuals, just beautiful people. They Now, Anna was barren. So she could not have children. And in Israeli society at that time, that was viewed as um, as a punishment, as like a divine punishment, that they had, somehow they had done something wrong. Now, they hadn't done anything wrong, but that is how they were viewed by um, by their fellow Israelites. So they, they had all this scorn heaped on them. They were treated lousy. They were treated with disrespect. And it was a terrible thing for them. And, and they mourned it, and they grieved it, and they were saddened by it. But they weren't saddened just because people were mean. They were saddened because they infinitely wanted to have a child. They wanted to foster a child that they wanted their, that sole purpose of that child was to bring people to God, to be a godly child. And in so doing, they went out to the garden and and saint maximus tells us different things like one minute they're in the garden the next they're in the temple um and they usually prayed separately so saint saint anna and saint joachim prayed separately but they prayed very fervent prayers just on their knees in supplication with tears um you know praying that they would get granted the same gift as had been granted you know sarah sarah's womb because she was barren too in the old testament um, now, one day, while they were in the wilderness, in the garden, they were praying and fasting, they were visited by an angel, okay? An angel visited St. Anna in the garden and says, God has granted your prayer. You will give birth to the bearer of joyful news and will call her Mary, from whom will come the salvation of the world, okay? So that's important, right? We have some uh, an angel coming down and telling them that, that they are going to have the Theotokos, the God-bearer. Also, another angel visits Joachim. We can presume probably at the same time, although St. Maximus isn't really clear about when they're visiting. But he says, you will have a child that will be glory for you and all the world. So from that point, one thing that's important is that they believed this angel. They were obedient. They were ready for this great gift to come upon them. Okay, now a difference between this Annunciation, say, and the Annunciation of Theotokos is this is a normal child conceiving moment between Anna and Joachim. Okay, they're not, this is not, um, the Holy Spirit is not making her pregnant or anything like that. This is, this is gonna be, and that's important because the Theotokos is born into in corruption. Okay, she has the same childbirth that all of us had. Okay, she is not, she does not experience the childbearing that the Lord had. Okay, she does not have a painless childbirth. Now, why is that important? Because the Lord has to take on our flesh. He has to take on our fallenness, our fallen nature, so that he can deify it, so that he can transfigure our flesh and divinize it. And you can't do that if she is somehow um, already pure, right? So she has to take on our flesh. So what happens then? St. Joachim and Anna, they hold a great feast. They are overjoyed. They're so happy and just, you know, celebrating this with, um, with their family and friends. Now, this, in, there is important symbolism of the barren womb. And that is that um, in the barrenness, it's symbolic of the barrenness of the sinful world, of a fallen world. And in... Um, and that this child is the wellspring of life. This spring is coming up in this barrenness. And it's symbolic of the curse and grief of our ancestors being washed away, right? It's going to get washed away and they are going to be freed 
from this curse, okay? Now, moving on to the nativity of the mother of God. So, uh, interestingly enough, even though this is our feast day, St. Maximus and even St. Gregory Balamas, they don't give us a whole lot of information about the nativity. Um, rather bizarre, um, but... I think the most important point, and like I said, even both their texts, it's maybe, it's just a couple lines. Um, the most important thing is that we know that they're, that, like I said, the Theotokos is born like us. One thing you can notice is in the icon, you see um, some folks, they say, you know, they get confused between the icon, between the nativity of Christ and the nativity of the mother of God, mostly because of, um, you know, Anna here, she looks very similar to the Theotokos, and so it can be a little bit confusing. You know, one thing you can always tell the big difference between the two is this is indoors. Okay, the Lord is born in a cave. The Theotokos is born in a house. You can always tell in an icon that it's in a house because, not only because of the background, it looks like a building, but when you see this um, cloth that is draped over the top, that means that it's indoors. So whenever you see that, that means it's indoors. So this, she's being born inside her parents' house. Um, she's not that she's not born in a cave. She's not born somewhere far away. So that's something important to remember. Now, what happens next? Um, so when she had reached three years of age, really young by our standards, um, that'd be very close to my daughter, who's going to be three this July. Um, her parents presented her to the temple, and this is the fulfillment of their promise to God, okay? Now, I think most of us think, and I could be wrong about this, but that when we present her, when she was presented to the temple, that she just went there for the day, just like when we have our, you know, our children come into the temple to be churched. It, this was not for the day. They, she stayed there. Okay, she stayed there as a virgin, and you can tell that even in the icon when you see these other women with the long taper bearers, those are other virgins who are committing themselves to God in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, so there's a prophecy in here um, from Psalm 44.15, uh, and it writes, it reads, uh, Maidens will be taken away in her train to the king. Those near her will be taken away to you. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, she is coming to the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies on earth, the temple, the divine temple. Why is that so important? Okay, it's important because this is where she's going to live until she's 15. And as she lives there, she's going to grow in wisdom. She's going to grow in understanding. She's going to meditate on the scriptures. And this is something I think that St. Maximus gives us that we don't normally think about is that she is putting in immense spiritual labor, okay? She's studying the scripture. She's next to the Holy of Holies. She's praying. She's fasting. She's participating in services. She is, in many ways, more resembling of one of our female monastics today, of a nun. She's living the life of a monastic in the Holy Temple, giving herself completely to God, making the decision to live a chaste life that she is not going to be married. She is going to remain a virgin the rest of her life. She's fully committing herself to God. Okay. Now, one thing that's interesting that you might be surprised about is that St. Maximus tells us that she was visited by the Archangel Gabriel many times during her life, during her time in the temple. And we actually see that right here in the icon. We look up at the top, we see the Theotokos and there is an angel and he is delivering food to her. All right, and we can interpret that as being spiritual food. He is instructing her, he is preparing her, and she is preparing in obedience for the Lord. Now, she doesn't know yet that she's going to be the God bearer, she does not know, she has no clue, but she is in such just fervent love for the divine that she is giving her whole self and is laboring intensely, intensely for the Lord. Okay. Um, as uh, another prophecy, you know, in um, uh, Proverbs 29, 42, it says, she clothed herself with pra power, prayer and dignity, excuse me. Um, and she received food from heaven is another thing St. Maximus tells us. So, 
what then happens? Well, while she's 12 years old, living in the temple, um, she was offering prayers during a midnight service in the Holy of Holies, and a bright light shone from the Holy Altar. So it was very late. We can assume that most of the priests, most of the other um, people that are visiting the temple, they had left at that time. A loud voice rang from the altar, and it said, Mary, you will give birth to my son. It, St. Maximus tells us that she was not startled, she was not frightened, nor was she joyful or proud, or proud. She was taken aback by it. She was surprised. I think we'd all be surprised if the Lord started speaking from our altar in Mayapak. We'd, we'd all be a little, maybe be a little frightened. So maybe we would be frightened. I don't know. I'd probably be frightened. But maybe, maybe you guys wouldn't. I don't know. Um, but had she was... One of the interesting things is that she hid this mystery. She she did not divulge it until the Annunciation. So she did not tell the other temple priests. She did not tell the other virgins. Nobody knew about this. Okay. Now, let's talk about Joseph, the betrothed. Okay. The law said at that time that the virgins had to leave the temple at 15. Now, I don't 100% understand or know why that is, but they had to leave when they were 15 years old. So this was just a period of their life that they had the opportunity to live in the temple. Now, again, in Jewish society, you had to get married, okay? You could not be a single woman living on your own in that time period. It was not acceptable. It was frowned upon. It was viewed as sinful, okay? So they had a bit of a dilemma there because the priests in the temple, they didn't want her to leave, but they knew they had to. And so they were worried. They're like, well, what's going to happen to her? We want to preserve her virginity. We want her to stay chaste because this is the life that she has decided upon. How do we keep her a virgin? Okay, so they came up with a solution. They said, let's gather some elders from, from Israel, 15 elders, and let's give them each, um, we will give them each a, I don't know why I'm missing it, um, a palm branch. I'm sorry, it was 12. It wasn't 15. 12. 12 palm branches. And then they prayed. And as they prayed, only one of those palm branches budded forth buds. And that was the one that Joseph was holding. Joseph the betrothed. Okay. Now, Joseph, this is important. Joseph was 70 years old. He was not young. In some of the depictions today, they present, they present Joseph like he's like he's 18 or something, and that the, he's madly in love with the Theotokos, and they, and they just love each other, and they're a family, and, and, and no. No, 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 no. St. Maximus tells us he was 70 years old. Why is it important that he's old? And in our icons, he's depicted as old because he was already a widower. He had already had children. He had already been married. And the priest knew that if they assigned Joseph to protect her, he would not try to consummate a marriage with her. He would not be interested in doing so. He is a protector. So yes, they are married, but they are not married in the sense that we are thinking. These are married in the sense of he married her to protect her, not to become one with her. Okay, He never becomes one with her at any point. He does not have a romantic relationship with her. I think he loves her because of his intense love for her in protection, in caring for her, in being a servant. But that's it. There's no romantic love here. Okay. And that is one of the misconceptions when we look um, sometimes in Latin and Protestant theology, they like to show the Holy Family, right? You've probably seen depictions of this. You've seen pictures of them together, embracing and kissing. Were they a family? Yes, they were a family, but they're not a family in the sense of that you and I are thinking about, right? Um, and so that is important. Now, Joseph, like I said, he, he's mature, he's wise, he's in control of his passions, at, at least as much as you can be in a sinful world. Um, you know, he's not sinless, he's not blameless, but he was a carpenter, and that was important symbolism too. He's a carpenter. He's about to serve the greatest carpenter, the greatest builder of all, the Lord himself, the Lord God, the Word. Um, one of the things he did, so Mary moves into his house, and he had young daughters, presumably in their late teens, 20s. Like I said, Mary, Mary was 15, 16 at the time. Okay? 
he puts Mary in charge of his daughters. He tells them, listen to her. And she was much wiser and more mature than they were, even though they were older than her. And so they, she teaches them. She teaches them and spends most of her day, much as she did in the temple, in prayer and fasting. So again, that spiritual labor component is very, it's important to remember that that continues. It, never see, it actually never ceases through her whole life, ever. So the Annunciation, something we're much more familiar with um, coming up this, you know, coming up this Friday. So glory to God. Um, you know, it had been six months since Elizabeth, the wife of the priest Zachariah, had been conceived of John the Baptist, the forerunner. As St. Maximus says, the dawn always comes before the sun, right? Now, I'm not going to get into that conception because I want to stay on the Theotokos, but very important symbolism. The Theotokos is standing next to a well. We see that depiction here in the icon, right? You see the water pouring out of the wall, um, which is supposed to be symbolism of the wellspring of life. She's going to give birth to the wellspring of life. She had this Annunciation during the first month of the year, which is when the world was created, also symbolic, the creator of the world, right? And it was the Lord's day, the first day of the week, for the creator of light to dispel the darkness, the darkness of the corrupted world, also important. And to make it even more interesting, it was the first hour, right? So very important symbolism. And Psalm 45, 6, God will come to aid at the break of dawn. So the angel greets her. And remember I said that they had known each other. He, she had, he had met her many times. So the angel comes and greets her. He said, calls her the favored one. She is favored because of her virtue. She's favored because of her spiritual labors. She responds with wisdom. She responds with tact. She does not question this angel like priest Zachariah did. She does not challenge him. She does not doubt him. She is startled, though. And there is a misconception here about why she is startled. So when we think she's startled, we think she's afraid. When we read that gospel passage, we think, oh, this angel, is, she's terrified because an angel appeared in front of her. No. St. Maximus tells us that she is not afraid of the angel. She knew the angel. What she was afraid of is that when he mentioned that she would bear the Lord, the God-man, the Theanthropos, she was afraid that she was going to lose her virginity. She was losing her chaste life. And she said, you know, how can this be? How can I become the God-bearer? I have not known a man. And she, when she says that, it's because she's afraid of losing her, her celibacy. So, now, like she says, how, how will this be since I have not known man? She wanted to be chased till the end. That shows her humility. It shows her obedience to what she had promised. Now, the angel tells her, the Holy Spirit will adorn you. The immortal bridegroom will overshadow you. The word will take flesh. And she allows this. Now, it's important to note, while this hell had been prophesied, the angel knew that she would say yes. She still had to make a choice. She still had to make the decision. And that is very important. That is a very distinctive distinction between what we believe as Orthodox Christians and what the Latins believe. She made this choice. She chose to be the God-bearer. Yes, the Lord chose her too, but she still had free will. She could have said no, but she didn't. She was obedient. So that is something that we should not forget. Now, she kept this secret. She didn't tell anybody, not her family, no one of kin. She didn't tell Joseph, and she didn't tell her cousin Elizabeth. Now, her parents had already died by this point. Joachim and Anna were deceased. So Elizabeth had lived like a mother to her. So she lives actually with Elizabeth for three months, and that is when the babe leaped, when St. John the Baptist left within her womb because he knew that the God man was coming. He was right next to him, and he was just thrilled. He was the forerunner. He was ready to announce his presence to the whole world. She, he returns to Joseph. 
She returns to Joseph, excuse me, after three months. And we know, we remember the story that he was grieved. He was grieved. He was grieved because he felt that he had failed as a protector, not that she had conceived. He wasn't feeling like she had betrayed him and that was no longer his wife. This is not adultery, okay? No, he had failed. That's what he thought. He said, I had failed her. What do I do? She, there's no way. And she's going to get punished. She might even get killed by the priests for this, what is perceived as infidelity. And that's, of course, when the angel visits him and dispels that fear and says, this is divine. This is the God-man. And Joseph, also unlike Prey Sakurai, he understands this and he believes it. Okay. We move on. She's pregnant with the Lord. And often in the depictions and the icons, we see a, an example of a spindle that she is sewing together his body inside her. She's putting flesh on the word of God who had existed before the ages. He had, he was there with Moses. He had been there when Adam was created. This is the Lord. He is not, he does not appear just on this day. He had existed before the ages, but as the God-man, this is the birth of the God-man, okay? He had taken on our flesh. Now, we know that at the Nativity, the Roman Empire had united the civilized world. That was important. It's important especially for the spread of the church. That all the other ancient kingdoms had fallen. They had collapsed. They had been destroyed. The Persians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, everything else that came before them was gone and wiped away. And all that was left was the Roman Empire to unite the civilized world. Okay. Power, St. Maximus said, had left Judah, the kingdom of Judah and Israel, and gone to the Romans. Now, the divine, the, the family, and when I say family, um, they left Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census. Now, why is Bethlehem so important? Well, St. Maximus tells us Bethlehem was the city of David's birth. Again, the symbolism, the king, the new king, the divine king, the almighty king is going to be born in the same place where David was born. Okay. He is born in a shepherd's cave. He is not born in an inn. He is not born in a barn. Now, that is, I think, where some of the confusion comes up because um, at that time period, caves were used by shepherds and as stables. So that's why... There were cows in there. And that's why they're depicted in the icons. But that does not mean that they were staying at some hotel, you know, some inn stables that looked like it was um, something out of a Wild West documentary. No, 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 no. This is symbolic. He's born in a cave. Again, think back to the barren womb of St. Anna. It is dark. It is symbolic of the corruption and the darkness of this world, the world that he came into. But he is the divine light, the light that cannot be quenched. And his light and his glory cannot be contained within this small cave. It is also symbolic of his later burial in another cave, in the tomb, right? So we see that symbolism too. Here is the uncontainable, the uncontainable Lord. And he is ending our corruption through theosis. Theosis meaning taking on our human nature and divinizing it. So, you know, it's important for us to remember too that even though he's just a little baby, he is holding the entire cosmos together. He is still always joined with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is in no time separate from them. Okay. Now, another interesting thing St. Maximus tells us is the star. And I remember growing up in California, we had a, a professor in Modesto, uh, a city near me, and they used to, he used to, this professor used to give a talk on the star. And he went into all this elaborate talk about how it, it was some kind of meteor or asteroid, and it was only there for a short amount of time. But what, um, but this was not a celestial star. This was not an asteroid. It was not a comet. St. Maximus tells us that he doesn't exactly agree that it was an angel, but he presumes it was an angel. He said that it doesn't 
the way it responded didn't match anything in the heavens, anything that you would see in the sky. He said, sometimes you'd see it by day, sometimes you wouldn't. Sometimes you'd see it by night. He said, sometimes it would appear close to you and sometimes it would appear far. It would, it would be constantly moving, generally in the direction from Persia to Jerusalem or to Bethlehem, but would be moving. Um, what else does he say? He says, you know, it appears someday it would be gone, it would disappear. And so that's part of the reason why the wise men were amazed by this. They marveled by it. Okay. Now, we know that the wise men run into Herod, King Herod, who is viewed as a as a madman, as a fool. He had misinterpreted Micah 5.2, which was a prophecy that the king was coming, which is why he was paranoid that he was going to get overthrown. But he didn't read the last part of the passage that talks about this is the king from eternity, God himself, right? Didn't, didn't understand that part. And we know the wise men bring gifts. These are symbolic gifts. Um, St. Maximus tells us that the gold is symbolic of a holy life. The incense is symbolic of wisdom. And the myrrh is symbolic of the mortification of the passions. And he says these are all things that which we should strive for. Now, there is a little bit of confusion. And actually, St. Maximus is very blunt about this. He says that, um, you know, Matthew speaks of the flight to Egypt and the slaughter of infants directly after the nativity. But he says, St. Luke says the opposite. He says that right after the nativity, there, on the 40th day, there is the presentation of Christ in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, he tells us that Luke comes first. So the presentation of Christ in the temple comes first. Okay. So the presentation in the temple. Now, Joseph and Mary, they bring the Lord to the temple after 40 days, they offer, you don't see it in this icon, but in some icons it shows um, Joseph holding a turtle dove and a pigeon, which is the, the turtle dove is symbolic of sobriety and solitude, and the pigeon is symbolic of meekness, and I can't even read my other word I wrote. Now, we know about the elder Simeon, he had waited for the Lord his whole life, he took him in his arms and departed shortly thereafter, but not until he had given a prophecy to the Theotokos that a sword will pierce your soul, right? Letting her know about the intense suffering that she would have from the Lord's passion. We also know that priest Zechariah had been grieved the Pharisees because he put the Theotokos in the line with the virgins. Okay, He did not line her up with the married women, but he put her with the virgins. And they were incensed by this. They were furious that he would have the audacity to do this. And he is killed shortly thereafter. He is murdered in the temple because of this. And the Pharisees conspire with Herod even to kill the Theotokos, which is why the angel comes, warns them, to flee, right? And we also have the prophetess Anna who had been there as well, and she is also depicted in this icon. Now, this is a lot of new information you'll get here that you don't have in the Gospels, the flight to Egypt. It does show up in the Gospels where we're gonna get a lot more information. Now, Herod, a paranoid, delusional king, had become so insane, he'd murdered his sons, he murdered his wife, he was so terrified to lose his earthly power. He was terrified that a child, a child was going to take his throne. This is ludicrous. So he ordered all male children under the age of two in Bethlehem to be murdered. And the saints tell us, um, if you read the prologue of Ored, if you um, even say Maximus says it was ghastly, just horrifying things they did to these children, dashed their heads upon stones, decapitated, on, on, so on and so on. And this is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah 38, 15, the voice heard in Ramah, Rama, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. It, uh, it also refers to Rachel and Benjamin. Rachel and Benjamin were buried in Bethlehem. So that's how the passage is connected to Bethlehem. Like as I said, Zechariah is slain in the temple. Now they tried to get Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth, and John the Baptist. They wanted to kill them too. Because remember, John was also an infant relatively young 
So Elizabeth flees with him to the mountains outside Jerusalem and says, O mountain of God, receive a mother and her child. And we are told that the mountain opened up for them to hide. And Elizabeth dies out there. She dies in the wilderness. It doesn't say when, how old John was when she died. We don't know. But John stayed in the wilderness, and that is where he survived. He found food in the desert till the time of his manifestation to Israel. The Lord and Joseph and the Theotokos are warned to go to Egypt. Now, this is extremely symbolic. This is a reversal of Exodus. When the Lord, the Word himself, had helped the Israelites flee from Egypt with Moses, now he is returning to Egypt. Egypt, the land of idolatry, and St. Maximus tells us that this was a land of intense idolatry, that they were worshiping crocodiles and cats and bizarre things, and there was ancestral things going on, and it was a depraved, he said, horrid society. But how ironic that the Lord himself is going to this idolatrous land, and they are friends. They, they let him live there. They receive him with open arms, and in doing so, he cleanses them. And St. Maximus tells us that he banished idolatry from the land. He destroyed it. And as a result, as we see, even by the time, even before St. Maximus's time, Egypt had become a wellspring of monasticism and was one of the strongest points of asceticism within the entire Christian world. What, a, what an intense transformation. Um, and Israel had become a land, had become the enemy. So what a reversal in fortune. Now, there are some interesting stories I had to, I thought they were in St. Maximus, but I had to go back and look at St. Nikolai Velomirovich. Um, he tells us a story of when there was a hot day, when the Theotokos and the Lord and Joseph were coming to Egypt, that the trees bent to provide them shade, showing the power of how nature was worshiping the creator. They bent to provide him shade, and then later as they left, the spring of water erupted from that spot, which a church was later built. They were also attacked by brigands. This is something you've never heard of before. Not brigands, but the story. Um, these brigands, these thieves, these bandits had seized the Theotokos' donkey. And as they approached the mother of God, one thief in particular, Dismas, saw the divine Christ child and was stricken by his unusual beauty, his divinity, because it's said that when when you could see the Lord back then, that his his flesh was almost so radiant in, in beauty and in divine light that it, it was awe-striking when you saw it. He said, Dismas said, if God were to take upon himself the flesh of man, he would not be more beautiful than this child. So at that point, this thief ordered his men to leave the travelers alone. The Theotokos responded, Know that this child will repay you with a good reward because you protected him today. Well, 33 years later, that thief, Dismas, died on the cross with the Lord. This is the repentant thief. So in, in being merciful to the Lord when he was a child, he received mercy. I mean, we also know that from his heartfelt repentance on the cross, too. So, But this is in addition to it. So this is important. Now, we know that after several years had passed, we're presuming three to five, Herod had died, horrible, horrible death because of his sins. Um, and his kingdom was split up between his three sons. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. So he, he goes into, um, they return to Israel, right? And from that point, um, we also have when the Lord went to the temple, okay? And I don't have a whole lot to say from there, but there is a part where the, the you know, the Lord is in the temple. He's a young, presumably, I don't know, teenager or something. He had been in the temple. He was gone for three days. She comes back with Joseph, and she, there's a point where she says, where have you been? You worried my father, your father and I. And he reminds her of his divinity. He says, I am in my father's temple. Joseph is not my father. The God the Father is my father. And, you know, another thing that St. Maximus tells us is that while he was teaching in the temple, he, he even though he was the God-man, he let the priests and the elders take the high place. Um, 
showing his humility and, and reminding her of, of his divinity. Now, St. Maximus tells us that the Lord did not manifest his power again until Theophany. Um, there doesn't seem to be any sense that the Theotokos was present, present at Theophany, even though um, St. Maximus tells us that most of the time she was with him in all of his miracles and all of their travelings, she was near his side, but she was not, at least as far as I can tell, she was not at his Theophany. Um, but she served him, um, and that's interesting that um, St. Maximus says again, the Lord did not manifest his powerful till theophany. And there's a warning in here. He says, stay away from Gnostic texts about his childhood. So well, there were lots of um, apocryphal books that had come out at the time that the Gnostics had proclaimed as being truth that spoke of his childhood. And he says, no, don't, don't read that. It's, it's been vetted and it has been found false. It is not true, it's not orthodox, it is heresy, don't pay attention to it. Um, so we move fast forward to the wedding at Cana, the Lord's first miracle where his, his ministry on earth really um, was manifested. And it says that the Theotokos, and you see it a little bit here in the icon, she, she wanted to see him manifest his power because she always knew she knew the prophecy, she knew his power, she knew what he could do. And so she kind of like teased him a little bit, you know, she, yes, there was no wine and she knew that and he knew that too. He knew he, he was all seeing, the Lord already knew there was no wine there. And, and we get a sense that he was, um, that he, I don't know that he would say he was annoyed, but he was like, ah, you know, like, I don't really want this thing. But she knew he was all powerful and limitless and that she, he wanted to honor her. He honored her request and therefore he did this great miracle. Now, um, we learned some interesting things actually about um, the husband and wife. They were so awe-inspired by this miracle. St. Maximus tells us that they both left, they stayed married, but that they left their household and followed the Lord. He became a servant that was following the Lord his whole life, and she was following the Theotokos um, as a servant. So just said, you know, you know, some of the some of the first real servants in the in the church. Joseph dies shortly after this miracle. Um, it's a bit confusing because he says she he was 110 years old, but earlier he had said he was 70. So if we figure that the Lord was 30, he'd be more likely to be like one of Joseph would be more likely to be like 103, maybe not whatever it doesn't really matter the point is he died um his sons james and jude become disciples of the lord um <clears throat> all right and as he says you know she is present at all of his miracles um she intercedes to the lord on behalf of the women that were following him and the disciples themselves. So really like um, an intercessor, just as she is today, interceding to the Lord on their behalf, you know, bringing their questions and also interceding uh, for the Lord to give them commands. She would relay those commands to them as well. I mean, he would talk to them directly as well, but it's important to note that she never separated from him during his earthly ministry. So from there, excuse me, St. Maximus fast forwards to the Passion on the cross. And he says that actually the Theotokos wanted to be present at the temple. She, he, she wanted, she yearned to come into the trial when the Lord was getting tried by the Pharisees. But they, she couldn't get in. They wouldn't let her in. They wouldn't open the door. She, there's no way she could get in there. And that's why she is not part of that trial. So she was not reunited with him until he had marched, you know, carrying his cross to Golgotha. And she was filled with despair, incredible despair. St. Maximus tells us sorrow, flooding of tears. You know, she was horrified that everyone, the whole world had forsaken him. Even his trusted, his trusted disciples, the apostles had fled. And he is amazed that she is not afraid of the mob. She's not afraid of these, she, St. Maximus calls them beasts. He calls them monsters, basically. These, these, these insane humans that are torturing the Lord of the universe. 
the God man in their presence was completely idiotic, had no concept of what they were doing. And she was not afraid. They say that she was a dove among snakes, is what St. Maximus says. And she was in perfect self control throughout that time. Not self control of her grieving. She was grieving, he says, more than anyone could have ever grieved in the entire history of man. Um, heartbroken, just filled with tears. And St. Maximus tells us that the celestial powers were furious, the angels, that they wanted to just take these, these, this mob and just fling them off the side of the world. But they, they restrained themselves. The Lord commanded them to restrain themselves. You know, he could have called upon the angels to come and he, they could have killed this whole mob in two seconds, but they didn't. He, they didn't do that. So while he's on the cross, Theotokos lifts up her hands. We see this. I think you see it even here in this icon. Yep. Um, she beat her breasts. She groaned from the depths of her heart in fulfillment of the prophecy that Simeon, Simeon had given her you know, many years prior. Um, we know that the Lord commands John, the beloved, the most, the disciple which was closest to him and the most humble to watch over her. And St. Maximus tells us this is a reminder for us to watch over our parents as they age and to care for them. Now, he tells us that she, the Theotokos, tried to convince the soldiers to give her the Lord drink, that he was so incredibly thirsty to give them water, and that they rebuked her. And that's when they gave her, him the, the gall, the vinegar, um, which is also in fulfillment of a prophecy, as we know. Now, St. Maximus says that the grace of the Lord protected her because of just the incredible sorrow that she had been having seeing him suffering, that he protected her not only from this mom um, with his divine power, but he also helped strengthen her soul so that she could manage this, that she could get through this. Um, she also, he says, she gathered the blood and the water when his side was pierced by the spear, that he, she gathered that from the life giver's side. Now, let's see if I have the right slide here. Ah, yes, the burial and lamentations. The Gospels are not always clear as to who was driving this, who was dry, who convinced Joseph of Arimathea to come and take the Lord off the cross. St. Maximus says very um, explicitly that um, she was driving this. She was, she knew of the tomb, of his tomb. He was near Golgotha and she sought out Joseph of Arimathea, uh, the owner of that tomb, and that she asked him to have the courage to take him off the cross. Now, that was terrifying for this man. But she, in her, as I said, perfect sense of control and her virtue and her godliness, convinced him to go to the Pharisees, to go to the Romans, these people who had just killed the Lord, terrifying that, that he might be killed too. And he goes and he does it. Is he afraid? probably terrified, but he did it. Joseph obeyed. He showed his reverence and in his deeds and his love and his trust in Christ. St. Maximus says that in exchange for his garden tomb, he purchased the heavens. And also reminds us, he says that this, that um, Joseph is the opposite of Judas, that Judas had delivered the Lord to his enemies, but, and given him the kiss of betrayal. But Joseph embraced him while well, taking him off the cross, he gave him the kiss of love and, and removed his nails from his from his hands and from his feet and anointed him with oil and precious myrrh and um, wrapped him in clean linens to be put into this tomb. Um, now, someone was asking me the other day about um, cremation and why as Orthodox we don't cremate. And that could be a whole lecture even unto itself, but I will just add this one point. This is how the Lord himself was buried. They did not put him on a funeral pyre. They did not incinerate him. They did not light him on fire and throw his ashes to the wind or dump him in the ocean. He was buried in a tomb, anointed with oil. It shows that we're supposed to treat the body with respect, 
that we are to treat it as the temple of God, and that in bearing it, it is like planting a seed in the ground, a seed which will rise from the dead at the final judgment, and we will be reunited with our bodies. And the Lord himself shows that in his resurrection. He, When he resurrects, he resurrects with his body, and we will too. And that is why we don't incinerate our bodies. Now, coming to the resurrection, the tomb, also symbolic of the Theotokos, the tomb was sealed. And the Lord himself, he goes down into Hades, the harrowing of Hades, not in the gospel, but in the tradition. He goes down to Hades. He breaks the chains of the prison in Hades. He releases Adam and Eve. He pulls them out of the tomb. That is our common Paschal icon that we look at. That is not the one here. Um, but we know that the Lord does these things and that he leaves the tomb. He leaves his burial shroud in the tomb. But the tomb is closed also as the Theotokos was closed. She was the virgin till death. So, um, St. Maximus insists that the women with spices um, did meet with the angel, but that the Theotokos was the one who had witnessed the stone rolling away from the tomb. He says that she knew of the resurrection before he had even died. She knew it was coming. She believed in it. She had faith in it. And she was waiting with joy and intrepidness. She knew it was coming, just like we know, like, Pasch is coming every year. And so the other women had left to go get myrrh and spices to anoint the body, which, you know, we've probably heard in other homilies is, is, is fascinating because this is, this, is no, this is not a wooden door. This is a massive stone. No one, these women would not have been able to open it. Um, and St. Maximus tells us that she is the one, that Theotokos is the one who relays the message of the resurrection to the disciples and the myrrh bearers. Now, John the evangelist had sold his family's estate in Galilee. They'd purchased a home in Jerusalem, and this is where the Theotokos lived out the last of her days. Um, and also where the Lord himself appeared to him, to the disciples during after his resurrection, the first appearance. And also eight days later, when Thomas had requested to see, you know, the holes in his hands and put his fingers in them. So from the resurrection until the assumption, the Lord appeared many times to the Most Holy Theotokos. St. Maximus tells us that he met with her way more frequently than he met with the apostles. And he comforted her, as he says, in accordance with his good pleasure. So the Lord... The Lord ascends, the ascension, he, he, he goes to sit at the right hand of the Father, but she continues living, the Theotokos continues living in Jerusalem under the care of John. St. Maximus calls her the source of virtue and the treasury of good things, a role model for all, and that before Pentecost she encouraged the apostles to hold fast to fasting and prayer, to remind them of the rewards and the crowns that would be bestowed upon them for their efforts. He says that while the apostles were spread throughout the whole world, here was the mother of God herself at the throat of the world, the, the very navel of the world itself, the center of the world, Jerusalem. She was living there while they were all around the world. And they would come back every year uh, for Holy Pascha. And that when they came back from Pascha, they would celebrate with her and tell her of their adventures, of their mission, missionary work, of their trials and tribulations. And she would comfort them and she would reassure them and strengthen them. And then they would return back onto their missionary work after. Um, we know that she was often at the tomb of the Lord. St. Maximus tells us that she would bend over, hands calloused from so many prostrations, that she would pray without ceasing and offer supplications for all. He also tells us that she was still viewed as a threat to the Jews. The same Jews who had killed the Lord himself, they viewed her with hatred, with malice, with miscontent, and one day they planned to kill her, just as they had planned, as they had killed the Lord himself. They ran over to her house with stones and fire, planning to burn her house down and stone her to death. But the Lord protected her. The angels protected her. And that fire 
ended up burning to death the people that tried to burn her house down and the stones which they threw at it they flew back at them and killed them and saint maximus tells us that they never again tried that and this is in fulfillment of the prophecy psalm 7 17 their trouble shall return on their own head and unrighteousness shall come down on their own crowd crown so they did not try this again but many marveled at this glorious mystery of her protection um, eventually the lord appeared to her in a vision uh, after many years and said that john the evangelist should go her way she was grieved but she was also that he would leave but she was also joyful because he, you know she wanted him to go out with the rest of the apostles and spread the message of the word of god so saint john the evangelist leaves um but even after she left she still she helped comfort and strengthen saint james the first bishop of jerusalem and um a very important you know that that her her place in god's ministry had not ceased from beginning to end right so saint maximus tells us that she had lived till 80 years of age she had lived in material poverty but she was filled with the greatest divine um glory that was possible on earth right just radiant in splendor and virtue um she was visited by the archangel gabriel again for the final time to announce her departure from the world he gave her a palm branch which was the symbol of victory now saint maximus tells us that she gave thanks and prayed she informed the apostles um the lord delivered first john the evangelist by a cloud brought him back so that he could arrange the funeral um, and prepare the proceedings um, and also then when it was time you know all the other followers, all the christians in jerusalem had come in the church the early church and they were they were grieved they were weeping they didn't know what to do without the theotokos and she reassured them she said be be glad my blessed children and do not make my translation a cause for mourning but rather rejoice that the eternal gladness is coming my lord and son his grace and mercy be with you forever and at that moment she lay down on the cot the same cot saint maximus says that she had repent that she had just sprayed with tears and just incessant prayers to the lord and supplications for her followers and even for her enemies that um a cloud was born on a breeze and all the apostles appeared suddenly from all across the ends of the world the cry then with a loud boom of thunder the christ himself appeared flanked by the angels more glorious and divine light than had been seen during the transfiguration far more beautiful far more um intense of a divine light the disciples fell on their knees they were terrified and he tells us that her dormition as a gift to her because of her obedience for being the mother of god she was spared the pains of death that so many of us bear when we die and we pass from this world as she had given the lord a painless childbirth so too was she did she have a painless death and the lord brought her soul to heaven and he tells us that many were healed of sicknesses and illnesses that day that the lame started to walk that the skies and the heaven itself were purified now with dormition her body had remained and so the the apostles they decided to bury her body in a tomb in gethsemane as they had with the lord um, there was a little bit of jockeying between who should do it whether it should be peter or paul uh, or james um there's a little bit of a thing where peter they they want peter to do it peter's like ah, i'm not gonna do it and finally he relents he leads the funeral prayer they anoint the body with oil saint john the evangelist is holding the censer and is in charge of the incense and both peter and paul bury the theotokos in or are preparing to bury the theotokos in the tomb now while they are carrying the theotokos away from her home to the tomb they are once again attacked by a jewish mob hoping to get one last chance to attack her and one man in particular tries to overturn the casket and saint maximus tells us that the moment 
he touched that casket, that casket, unlawfully transgressed, an angel severed off his arms, completely sliced them off of him. Imagine the horror of that. And actually, the minute that happened, the rest of the mob dispersed. Um, this man, in intense agony and pain, um, glory to God had come to his senses at that moment. And I hope we all would if our arms got chopped off of us. Uh, begged the Theotokos for forgiveness, begged for mercy. And um, in, so, in so doing, um, she granted his petition. The Lord granted her, her petition. And um, Peter stopped the procession. He brought the mans back to him, reattached them, and they were completely reattached with no wounds, with no, no sense that they had ever been removed. And this man was so touched by the mercy of God and the forgiveness of the Theotokos that he, um, he later became a follower. And we don't know, but probably a martyr as well. Um, they buried her in a tomb, as I said, and covered it with a stone. And on the third day, they returned, and she was gone. Her body had been risen as a special gift as well, as had only really happened with Elijah. And her body was taken up to heaven, and all that was left with the bur was the burial shroud in the tomb. And... The apostles rejoiced in this. They they shut the grave again and, and they rejoiced. So this is the life of the Theotokos, the life of the Virgin. Um, glory to God. Thank you for viewing this talk with me. I hope it's been spiritually edifying um, and we can now go through some questions. Thanks.